Well, I uh, I was uh, born into a union family. My uh, my father, Wilfred Gerard, was a, a volunteer organizer for the Mine Mill and Smelter Workers Union, and uh, he got very, very active in the union in the 50s and 60s. And uh, part of my youth was spent uh, following my dad around to union meetings and uh, going to union halls. And while they'd be in a meeting, I'd be hanging out and doing something. And so that uh, I, uh, I got to understand the importance of the labor movement really early. And uh, remember in the, one of the strikes with uh, INCO, in uh, in the 50s that uh, uh, my dad helped to raise funds and uh, f they call it the scrounge committee get donations so that families could make it through a very difficult strike with INCO and then uh, I went to work in the smelter in 1965 at INCO and for the first couple of years I uh, wasn't very active in the union uh, but I saw that things hadn't changed much so I got to be active in what was then Local 6500 of the United Steelworkers and uh, got active in the local and got to be chairman of the grievance committee for the what they called the reduction side, which was the smelter and the mills, refineries. Uh, and then from there I got hired by the union in 1977 and uh, worked for the Steelworkers Union in uh, Toronto. Okay. Uh, for a while, and then Hamilton for a while, and then Elliott Lake for a while, and then uh, got elected district director for Ontario. So it was uh, starting from my early teen years till till I got elected director. My pretty much big part of my life was uh, uh, based on the values I learned from my father. Okay, and uh, whose picture is right there over my. Uh, shoulder all the time. Keeping an eye. Keeping an eye. Yeah. Um, you had mentioned the, the first few years you started officially working was in a smelter for, for Inco. Mm -hmm. um, what you had, you had also mentioned nothing had changed or not much had changed since you'd follow your father uh, working for the union. So what hadn't changed? What were well, some of the issues you, you in, were Inco was very, at, in, in those days, uh, in the 50s and 60s, Inco was a sort of very uh, autocratic place. Uh, much of the time the president and CEO of INCO was from the American military. Uh, they ran it uh, almost like a military operation and uh, we needed to have a strong union in the workplaces to uh, defend the membership and advance our interests. And so in the department I, uh, I managed to get myself transferred from uh, what, the, what they call then the converter oil. I worked in the converters, which is a, it's a complicated process of extracting the minerals uh, through a furnace and all that jazz. Uh, I got myself demoted to uh, the transportation department as a yard laborer so I could go to school at night at Laurentian University. And uh, when I got myself demoted to yard labor, there was no steward, no representation in the department. And uh, I always carried the contract book in my pocket so that if I had to defend myself, I knew it was there. And uh, some of the folks in the transportation department was where I got myself demoted to. Uh, wanted someone to represent them and um, they signed a petition asking me if I would represent them and uh, I hesitated a while because I wanted to go to school. But then I decided that uh, I had to do that. Um, because of my father's values and so I became a shop steward and then from there I became chief steward of the reduction section and from there a staff rep and then from there a regional director and okay and were there when you started off were there specific goals you had in mind specific things to uh, to change or fix yeah we wanted our folks to be treated like human beings I mean if you were in a example if you're on the track gang uh, they loaded you into the back of a five-ton truck and took you up on the slag dump and dumped you off in the middle of the winter and you had to keep warm by trying to start a fire in one of the shacks and uh, if you got into the in, in those days if you went into the shack a little too early or a little too often there was some boss up there that was going to discipline you while you're up there with a 40 and 50 mile an hour wind and 30 below weather and so 
that kind of crap we weren't going to put up with. Yeah. So those kinds of things, I mean, and uh, they didn't respond all that well to me in the company, to me being a steward. They tried to ostracize me a couple of times. Uh, in the summer, they actually sent me out on the road raking stones off the road. It was kind of a little chess game. So, and, and I hung in and we actually made a difference, made some changes. And before jumping further into your career, uh, what did you take at Laurentian? Uh, I went for a while and studied economics and political science. I didn't okay. get to finish because I got transferred. I got hired by the union, really. Okay. And from there, there you go. And uh, why economics and political history? Uh, political science. Yeah, political science. Uh, because yeah. <laughs> I was interested in it. In fact, at, at one time, I wanted to be a. I really wanted to be a teacher, and I thought a lot of the. Uh, a lot of the stuff that they taught you in the textbooks at uh, at uh, university about economics were about three steps from reality, and it, it may look good in a textbook, but it doesn't quite apply in reality. And in fact, I remember one time in one of the classes, uh, some um, banker guy was talking about budgeting, and he wasn't making a lot of sense. And I felt I should intervene, and I told them that um, my dad worked in the mine and raised five kids and my mom was a stay-at-home mom and if he really wanted to learn about budgeting he should call my mom. Uh, she could tell you how to budget. You got five kids to raise and a husband on a one person income and in those days you didn't make a lot of money. So that was kind of fun. <laughs> and so from there you took uh, which job? I was a, um, I was asked to be, a, well, I didn't quite go from there, I became chief steward of the reduction section. And then I got involved in the internal union politics, also supporting um, our uh, subdirector, Gibby Yotrist, and he lost the election. But uh, he, uh, he recommended me to the then president and secretary treasurer, Lloyd McBride and Lynn Williams. And uh, they asked me to go on the staff in 1977. So I went on the staff of the union and uh, the job that was the job that was available was in Toronto. I'd never been to Toronto on my own from Sudbury. And uh, so I said to uh, to the uh, director at the time, Stuart Cook, I said, uh, I would really be interested in the job. And uh, he talked about going to Southern Ontario. I said, well, that'd be okay. I thought Southern Ontario, Kingston, London, Kitchener, um, so I said I'd be okay, but I said, look, I need time to get out of my courses because I'm taking courses at Laurentian as a mature student and I can't afford a failure on my, mm -hmm. my transcript, so I need to give them advance notice and all that stuff. And he said, fine. And then uh, he would go and see if he could get permission to hire me. And uh, a couple of weeks later, I got a phone call back from his assistant, Ken Levac, who said, uh, Stu got permission to hire you and uh, you're to report to uh, the Toronto office on Monday morning. I said, Toronto office? He said, yeah. I said, Stu said I was going to go to Southern Ontario. Kenny said, where the hell do you think Toronto is, kid? You're going to make it or not? And I said, well, I'll, I'll, I'll be there, but I need some time to get out of my uh, classes at the university so I don't end up with an F on my record. He said, uh, well, you have that opportunity when you go back you make arrangements with them can you make it to Toronto on Monday I said yeah I'll be there uh, I don't want to indict General Motors but we my wife and I had a Chevy Vega uh, you're too young to even know what that is and I uh, drove it to Toronto um, got some assignments and one night I'm driving back from membership meeting and the back rear wheel fell off the goddamn car <laughs> so here I am in Toronto been there for a week don't know where I'm going and have Chevy Vega and the wheel fell off it. So that was my uh, my start at being a union rep in Toronto. Okay. Yeah. And, um, and throughout your, your early career, is there, I mean, speaking of, of the wheel falling off, is there a specific job or, or something you worked on that just pops to mind as being well, dysfunctional? No, that uh, it's, instead of being dysfunctional, we were trying to create something. And uh, the uh, the national director of the union at the time, a person by the name of Gerard Duckier, he uh, he wanted to to build a uh, much broader education program to uh, 
train and de develop leadership in amongst the rank and file membership, and it was called Back to the Locals. So we would uh, uh, build a training program. I don't know that most people haven't read the book. It's uh, Pedagogy of the Oppressed by a guy named Pablo Ferrari, who wrote a book about uh, how, how was he going to train peasants in his country so that they would know what their rights are. So what he did was he trained people to be trainers, and those trainers went out and trained trainers, and they went out and trained trainers, so they created a network, and that was the then national director's vision. And uh, I really was excited about that. In fact, I had been chair of the education committee in, back in my home local. So I worked with him and uh, the head of the education department in the national office to institutionalize the Back to the Locals training program. And I spent uh, pretty much all of my career as a staff rep, whether I was in uh, Toronto, Hamilton, or Elliott Lake, uh, building that Back to the Locals education training program. So for me, that was a very, very important part of the transformation of the union, of uh, building no or creating and building an opportunity for members to get knowledge about how to work within the union and advance their own interests and build a structure for broader participation. So rather than fixing something dysfunctional, we built something from scratch, which was much more exciting, and it still goes on. I mean, that's, you know, take it from 1980 to now. That's uh, it's a long time, and that program is being, and we do a lot of that now here in the headquarters when I'm president, doing lots of that outreach to give the rank and file membership more participation in the union. Okay. And, and how did you get from working um, in the union in Canada to the United Steelworkers headquarters? Well, it's, it's, a, it's a story of, uh, in some ways, being in the right place at the right time. Uh, I was a, uh, by all standards, a young steelworker staff representative. I was 37 or 38 years old. And uh, we were dissatisfied with the uh, district director that we had at the time. And so we uh, put together a committee that would choose someone to run against them. Which was which district, sorry? Six, Ontario. Okay. And uh, it, it, it was the largest by membership district in, uh, in the Union in those days. We had 100,000 members just in that district, a little over 100,000. And so um, I promoted and actively advanced the uh, leadership of a person, a person named Morris Keck. We called him Mo Keck, Morris, and uh, he was he was sort of the consensus person of the committee to choose a candidate for a director. And Mo had a heart attack. When Mo had a heart attack, a lot of people got nervous about what if he had a heart attack during the campaign. What most people don't know is we're the only union that has a one person, one vote for every member in the same 24-hour period. So you get elected by the rank and file. They all have an opportunity to vote. Do they all vote? Not all, but usually the overwhelming majority. So people got nervous about what would happen if Mo had a heart attack during the campaign. And so there was a reevaluation, and there were a committee meeting to choose a new candidate. And uh, I got chosen. Um, as I say, it's luck and being in the right place at the right time. I was the youngest person by age on the staff, and I'd only been on the staff about eight years, so I was pretty pretty young, and um, that led to me becoming the district director of the largest district in the union. And so we worked hard at expanding the rank and file participation programs. Uh, we worked hard at uh, looking at doing things differently. We did a employee buyout of Algoma Steel. Uh, we uh, bargained the first index private sector pensions in North America. Uh, Algoma Steel that we did an employee buyout of was the largest em employee-owned operation in North America. So we did a lot of innovative things. We created the first women's committee because the union was a male-dominated organization because of steel, mining, smelting, all that kind of stuff. So we created a, a women's committee called Women of Steel. Uh, we uh, expanded the uh, 
uh, back to the local training program. We trained more instructors. We put together an anti-racism program and went and got employers to pay to teach their own employees by our members. We expanded our health and safety campaigns. Uh, we did all those things. And uh, then uh, in, in the late 80s and early 90s, uh, the uh, president of the steelworkers at the time was Lynn Williams, another Canadian. And in fact, one of my heroes and my mentors, um, Lynn was getting ready to retire from the union and he wanted, uh, wanted me to come to the United States uh, as secretary treasurer of the union. I initially said no. I, uh, by this time I was national director, by the way. In 91 I became national director when Gerard Dockier retired for health reasons. I became the national director and I'd only had the job for a little over a year and uh, my sense was there had been a lot of change in the union. Uh, I went from being district director to national director. Gerard Dockier left. Len Stevens, who had been the western director, he had a stroke and was not able to function so we had to get a new western Canada director. Our district director in Quebec was new because uh, when Gerard Dockier retired so did uh, the, the, on the Quebec director, so we had, and if I was going to leave, we needed to get a new director in Canada, and I thought there was way too much change going on at the same time, and uh, we needed some stability in the union. And Lynn, in fact, uh, said, look, at the union's under attack in the U.S., and if the labor movement dies in the U.S., it's not going to be good for Canadian labor. And he, uh, he convinced me that I should come to Pittsburgh. So I came to Pittsburgh as the secretary treasurer, and I worked with um, the then president of our union, George Becker, and we became good friends. And uh, George ended up also leaving early before the end of his second term with prostate cancer. So in, in some ways, I've advanced, as I said, through a combination of luck and being there at the, at the, at the, right. At the right time. But also, uh, I mean, quite proud of the staff we built and the work we did. and. Uh, when uh, when the International Executive Board got to appoint uh, a replacement to finish George's term, I was really proud that I was the unanimous choice. And again, I was relatively young for that job. Uh, when I first got it, my hair was all dark. <laughs> so that's sort of a, a, a Coles Notes version of okay. of uh, thirty plus years. And you're also the the you had mentioned Lynn. Uh, Lynn Williams. The only other Canadian to, ma to become president of uh, I, not, not only that, uh, Lynn and I are the only two Canadians to become president of any international union. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And so you're, now as president, you're known for having uh, brought in hundreds of thousands uh, of workers into the union throughout um, your, your terms as president. So initially, what was your goal? Uh, and and how'd you go about uh, doing that? How'd you go about increasing that number drastically? Well, I, th I think that the goal has to be kept really simple. As uh, one of my friends said, workers join unions so that they can improve their lives. That's it, it's simple as that. So once you accept that, that workers join unions because they want to improve their lives, then you look at what things can you and should you and must you do to improve their lives. and. Uh, it's it, it's such a uh, it's such a heavy lift that if you're so arrogant as you think you can do it by yourself, you'll fail. And 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 in the labor movement, we got to say we and not I. And so you got to build a broad base of participation, which will convert itself to a broad base of support. Then you've got to put meaningful ideas in front of them and see if they'll support them and and advance them. And uh, that's that's something that. Uh, that we've been good at in our union is, is broadening that base, broadening an opportunity for participation. And so that when you're out uh, either looking at bringing in other unions in to merge into your union or you're going out to organize new workers, when they look at you, they got to look at you and say, yeah, that would help, and then make their decision. If they look at you and say, that's a bunch of fat white bureaucrats, why would I want to be part of that? And so the challenge for a union like ours right now is a very difficult one. With shrinking manufacturing and mining base in US and Canada, 
the opportunity for hiring to our employers is diminished. And if we're a union that doesn't hire, we represent. So if we have a mine, take my hometown of Sudbury, if we have 3,200 members in local 6,500 and 200 leave in retirement and Valley doesn't hire anybody else, we've lost 200 members, but that's not our fault. Mm -hmm. And so when we're gonna try to grow and broaden the base of the union, one of the things we gotta be cognizant of is our best chance is if we're a reflection of the society we're in. Now, because our employers do the hiring and through that we get membership, we have an obligation then to push our employers to look and sound like the society that they're in. So we need more women, we need more people of color. In Canada, obviously, we got to, I mean, in Canada, I think it's an embarrassment the way we've treated Aboriginal First Nations people. And so right now, our union, and, it, and I was really proud of it when I was director, we negotiated collective agreements where we included First Nations people, and we included in those collective agreements recognition of First Nations people's rights, whether they needed to be off their fishing and hunting times for their families. How do they get training opportunities? We did all those things then. Uh, and I think it's imperative on us in both Canada and the United States that we attempt to have our movement look like and sound like a reflection of our society, which means in our case, we get to have push our employers to do that, mm -hmm. which was one of the things I was really proud of when our union did the anti-racism training right across the country and made thousands of our members take that training, but paid by their employer. So. Uh, those things are really important and if you're going to survive in the long run and, and be credible in the long run that's what we need to do uh, when we merged with uh, a number of unions they uh, on a number of occasions with the large mergers the rubber workers and the paper and allied workers uh, they talked about should we change our name and my answer was no and the reason we shouldn't change our name is our name has a history and it has a credibility in Canada, whether it's in Ontario, British Columbia, or Newfoundland. The same thing in the U.S., we have a credibility with our name. So that our name, just our name alone, opens doors. So if we put the right people in the right positions, those door openings can provide opportunity for making a better world and a safer place for our members. It's reputation. Reputation. Yeah. And what's the total count now? What's the membership? 850,000. And if we, if we do active and retired, because we, we, we insist that we can still represent retired workers uh, with, in particular, their health care in the U.S., in with US. pensions in Canada, all of those things. 1.2 million is the number we, we talk about. Now, awesome. it's not a true number, to be blunt and to be honest about it, because at any one time, about 10% of our membership is not working whether they're on layoff, whether they're on sickness and accident, whether they're on vacation. So, uh, and, and the retiree numbers, uh, our, best, uh, our best hope to get accurate numbers, to get them from our employers. How many retirees are left at Valet? How many retirees are left at uh, whatever the facility is in Canada? At, uh, you know, you take, for example, the, what's going on right now in Canada with U.S. Steel trying to liquidate what used to be Stelco. Uh, we've got 20,000 retirees there. We have an obligation to speak up for them and to fight for them while this company is trying to uh, deny them their pension benefits that were promised. Mm -hmm. you know, and, and to be a little bit political, uh, those promises were made to Stephen Harper. And Stephen Harper never held them accountable to meet those promises. So I'm really damn glad he's gone. I've, uh, I've also You'll probably edit that out, but it feels good saying it. <laughs> I've also, say what, say what you'd like, I've also interviewed so, someone who had mentioned a very similar thing happening with Naranda. Yeah. And how they were also <coughs> promised uh, yeah. you know, a healthy yeah. pension and, and got pretty much none of that when... when yeah, the, the Bronfmans owned Naranda. They took good care of the Bronfmans. Mm. Mm. Uh, so, so correct me if I'm wrong here, but the, United, the international um, United Steelworkers is the largest uh, industrial union in North America. Mm -hmm. And it now encompasses, it's the dominant union really in paper, forestry products, steel, aluminum, rubber, glass, chemicals, and petroleum. Anything else I missed? Mining in Canada. Mining in Canada. We're not the, we're not the biggest mining union in the U.S. We're nip and tuck with the miners uh, mm -hmm. union, but we're the largest mining union in Canada. And to us, that's really important. Uh, it's, it's pretty interesting that... Uh, uh, for a period of time, uh, until just uh, 
the end of December, I and all of our Canadian directors had come from the mining industry. Uh, in, uh, in December, we had one of our district directors that went to work for the Solidarity Center, or uh, Solidarity Fund, I should say, in Quebec, and the person that took his place, I think, came out of an industrial facility, not of mine, but uh, so it's, it's a reflection that uh, being a union rep in the mining industry is a good training ground, because most of them are bastards. And um, <coughs> you had mentioned a few times um, it started a committee and a project called Women of Steel. Mm -hmm. And could you talk a bit about how the presence and the role of women has uh, potentially changed from when you started working? Sure. When I became the when I became the uh, Ontario director, District Six director, we didn't have a functioning women's committee, and and like I said, uh, the hiring goes on. the The hiring is done by our employers, so our membership is a reflection of who the employer hired, and so if we were going to advance. Uh, women's rights within our existing facilities and push for more hiring of women. We need to have some kind of structure, so we need to create a women's committee. And uh, at, at that time, the Ontario Women's Directorate, uh, which was a spin, uh, an, an arm of the Ontario Ministry of Labour, was giving grants for training. And uh, with uh, Stephen Lewis's help, we put together a grant proposal for a grant to do some training for women in the Steelworkers Union. And we developed something called the Women's Leadership Course. And we invited our local unions to identify women that would be able to attend the Women's Leadership Development Course. And um, we probably had 30 or 40 that were, were recommended. And we did some training and we were using the same philosophy, the as we were doing in the Back to the Locals program, how could we train women that could go out and train other women who could go out and train other women? And so after a, a couple of meetings of the uh, Women's Leadership Development Program, women at the time told me they didn't like the name. Women of Steel? No, Women's Leadership Development oh, okay. Program. And I said, well, I don't care, you know. Why don't you guys pick a name? So they said, okay, give us some time. So I left the room. They were meeting in our district office at the time. I came back after they called me back, and I can't remember now if it was 20 minutes or an hour. I don't remember. But they came back and said, uh, we've got our name now. And I said, what's the name? They said, the Women of Steel Committee. I said, wonderful. It's better. I agree. And then, yeah, and that's the name they picked. And so I asked them why they picked that. And they said, A, because they came from the Steelworkers Union, all of them, but also you had to have a steely back to be a woman in these workplaces. And so they were women of steel. Perfect. And it made the point. And so that was the district program. I then uh, talked about it at a board meeting. Uh, Lynn Williams, who was the president at the time, said, this is terrific. We should build a program like that. And we passed some resolutions at the International Convention to build programs. And I just now have totally lost track how many resolutions over the years we've passed to get where we are. We will have an international women's conference in March. Uh, there will probably be somewhere between 12 and 1,500 women that will be here. It will be the largest single gathering of working class women in North America. Really? Yeah. Oh. And so that's a huge pride. We've now opened the, we've opened the executive board. We've now got a first woman on the board. We're going to get more. We've now got women in leadership roles in our locals, in our staff, and it's a long, hard, program to keep working because people pass through the union, they come and go, and so you were a leader on Thursday, but you're retired on Friday, and so you got to find new leadership, and so we, we've now got a program within the Women of Steel program to mentor, ever, another, mentor other women. We're sending, we'll be the largest union delegation at the United Nations Conference on Working Women. Uh, we'll have probably upwards of 20 women from U.S. and Canada at that U.N. conference. Uh, we have... Um, a women's committee that interacts with uh, a new organization that we created called Workers Uniting, which is the it's the creation of a new union between Unite the Union in Great Britain and the United Steelworkers. So we created a new labor movement institution called Workers Uniting. It's now chartered in Britain, Ireland, United States, and Canada, and we have joint training programs based on our back to the locals program. So we have people that go over to uh, London or Ireland. We have people that come back to United States or Canada 
who participate in joint training programs. We have a leadership development program, a four-year program. This year we have people from Sweden, from Germany, from South Africa, from Australia, and from Great Britain in our, lead in our leadership development program with our members and with our women. And now we've got another program we're going to call the Lynn Williams Scholarship Program where we're going to try to take what appears to be the best and brightest of our people of color, our women, our young people, next generation, and put them into an advanced leadership program. The theory is that this year we might have 10, but if we do 10 for 10 years, that's 100. And how do you broaden that base? And those are all people that can take their knowledge somewhere else, which is, I think, one of the reasons why we've had uh, success in so many mergers. That's how you said you started with yeah. the, the web effect. I yeah. Guess. yeah. And uh, just out of curiosity, <coughs> which, um, which um, I guess, industry is uh, where there's the biggest presence of women in the unions? Oh, now? Uh, <laughs> So the, the biggest single presence of women now is in our healthcare sector. Uh, we have about um, 50,000 healthcare workers. And, and again, the history of the union, we were the first healthcare union. People don't know that. No. During the um, period from 1935 to 45 and through the war, um, a guy named Henry Kaiser was, uh, I mean, I can't remember exactly his positions. He, he was a senior person in the Roosevelt government. And he was extremely rich. He owned steel mills, aluminum mills, whatnot, but they were all primarily out in the West Coast. And uh, he was a pretty decent guy. He didn't oppose unions and all that jazz. And uh, he decided that his workers needed a clinic. So he created a, a clinic for his workers. And, and, a, and a real clinic, not a make-believe one like Inco used to have, but a real one. And uh, we were the first union at the clinic. That has evolved into the Kaiser healthcare system. Our local in California, local 7600, is the original local of the Kaiser healthcare system back in the 40s. And there we have about 9,000 members in that healthcare system. And so as a result of that, in places where we're the dominant union, primarily in the United States, up in the Iron Range, uh, the Virginia, um, West Virginia corridor, uh, we've got uh, people that wanted to be in a union and they chose the union because we we're the dominant union in that area. So that network is 80% women. and and. The other thing that's happening is that in many of our industrial settings, we've been pushing hard for 30 years that the companies have to be a reflection of society, so we're getting more and more women. And as we get them into leadership roles in our union, it helps convince the employers that they need to have more women too. So if you say which industry has got the most per capita of women, it's the healthcare members that we have in our union. But if you go into our industrial settings, um, It'd be hard to say which one was the most, but in each one of them, the membership of women is growing. Okay, good. Um, to switch it up a little bit, uh, uh, you are and have been for years um, a strong supporter of a green economy, and, and I've, I've seen you mention that a few times. Yeah. Uh, could you elaborate, and, and how do you see this coalescing with mining and metallurgy? Well, look at the... the um, there, 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 there's things that I remember from my youth. Um, I don't know if I said this. I, I lived in a company house in Lively, Ontario. Uh, we went to the company clinic, uh, and I can tell stories about that. I went to the company school where the superintendent of the school was actually a superintendent at Creighton Mine. Um, and. I wasn't uh, till I was about 20 years old that I understood you could run track without sucking in sulfur fumes. The, the, the sulfur emissions from the smelter blew cross country to where I went to school, Lively High School, Coppercliffe, the schools that I worked or uh, had friends at. And I remember there was a, a road from a part of Sudbury called Gatchel to a place called Coppercliffe, where in the spring and the fall, it would get so foggy that you'd have to have someone 
standing outside walking alongside the car for a quarter mile, three quarters of a mile to make sure that you didn't run into somebody and you could try to try to say keep to the left, keep to the right. And I can remember Inco saying that that wasn't their fault. We had an environmental committee and our local guy by the name of Paul Falkowski chaired it. He just stayed on them and stayed on them and stayed on them. And finally they built a reservoir to hold it back while it cooled off and the fog went away. So, and, and if you remember that Sudbury region where people walked on the moon before they got ready to go to, to walk in outer space, our union created an environmental committee. I wasn't on it. I was not even there yet. And, and again, this guy Paul Falkowski and others in the, in the local, Mickey McGuire and others fought for environmental rehabilitation so that Inco created a nursery underground with artificial lighting and lots of humidity to grow plants to plant and to transplant the region. And so if you were, went to look to Sudbury in 1970, it looked like a barren wasteland. You go to the Sudbury region now, it looks like brand new forest. Yeah, it was rated one of the most beautiful cities yeah. recently. Yeah, right? 320 lakes within yeah. the city limits, of which you can swim in 290, yeah. or fish, or you know. So that that the larger that is, the unions fighting for it. Mm -hmm. And they, uh, you had mentioned they had started a greenhouse underground. Yeah, is that because none of it would have survived above land? Or? No, I think it was just because it was a much better environment. It was yeah. constant okay. humidity, and they put artificial lighting. And, and the things just grew faster. Okay. It was lighting 24 hours a day and humidity 24 hours a day. And so it just was a better place. And in fact, it, 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 it morphed into doing a lot more. I think they were growing tomatoes and cucumbers and well, I was long gone. So, so um, when, I, when I became president of the union, uh, with, with the help of a, f a person named Dave Foster, uh, we started pushing environmental issues, and in fact, we should get, uh, Scott, we should get uh, the two environmental papers we got, Our Children's World, that we did in 1990. The Steelworkers Union passed an environmental statement in 1990 that said one of the most important uh, issues facing the future of the world was global warming. We said that in 1990. We said it before most of the environmental movement was saying it, and the reason is we see it. And so we did a, a document called Our Children's World. Then we redid one eight or nine years ago called Still Our Children's World, or Still Not Clean, or I can't remember the exact title. And that was endorsed unanimously by our board. And, and part of it is that we understand that most of the time before things got out into the environment, emissions and whatnot, it came out of the plant. And our members would suck it in if we didn't clean it up. So. Then we concluded that there is uh, the divide and conquer approach of sort of major corporations applied in this instance. We'll keep the environmentalists mad at the industrial workers and we'll keep the industrial workers mad at the environmentalists. That way we'll always be able to control what goes on. And so we concluded that we should uh, try to put that to, and, and stem it, stop it. And so. Uh, we took a position as a union. It's not a clean environment or good jobs. It's not good jobs or a clean environment. It's you'll have both or you'll have neither. And so then how do we clean up our workplaces? How do we take carbon out of the air? I mean, I think that there's a big, there's a big mistake that some are making. Um, to think that you could run a global industrial economy without fossil fuels is just nuts. You, can, you can't do that today. You might be able to do it sometime in the future, and we should have a plan to be able to reduce our, ne our, our, our um, need for fossil fuels. But if you really want to take most of the carbon out of the atmosphere, we should uh, redo all of our public buildings, all of our private buildings. Our buildings are the largest emitters of carbon. We should have uh, a strategy about how to capture carbon and can we make use of it. There's now research going on where they can take carbon out of the air and turn it into carbon fiber. Uh, we do some of that kind of research. So our view was uh, there's good jobs in a clean environment. There's a good job uh, program in taking carbon out of the atmosphere. How do you harness that? Harness that. There's good jobs 
in creating renewable energy through geothermal, uh, uh, wind, solar. Uh, there's got to be a way to take, uh, and, and I saw some of this in Denmark, uh, how to take our, um, our waste and convert it to energy. In, in Denmark, they've got a, basically an incinerator that incinerates everything. And it's right within the city limits. And I say to the, to the taxi driver, I said, if it's so efficient, why do you have those stacks? He says, well, we've got stacks and we've got bag houses on them just in case there was an emergency. I said, how often have you used them? He said, I don't think they've ever been used. So, th so there's, there's an opportunity there. One small incinerator, I'm told, can take the equivalent of 15 feet high of the equivalent of one football field per year of waste. So uh, I'm not married to anything, but what I think is that you've got to have a blue-green strategy. If, if cleaning the environment people lose their jobs, then they'll fight about that. If people who have jobs don't want to clean the environment, they'll fight about that. How do we bring two together so we're advancing the environment and creating good jobs? And so, you know, that, that I, I always wanted to have Sudbury become the, uh, after we did the rehabilitation of the land, I always believed that Sudbury could be uh, a center for uh, renewable energy. At one time, and again, I've been gone from the details for a long time, but at one time Sudbury was considered the sunshine capital of Canada. Got more hours of sunshine on it per year than almost any other place in the city. So if that's the case, you get all these huge tailings fields that we're now growing wheat on that nobody will ever eat. Put solar panels up there. Yeah. You get miles and miles of, you put solar panels up there. Well then, you know, that's not, at the time it wasn't Inco's primary focus. It's certainly not Valet's focus, but it's something that we should think about. How could you create a company that would rent the space from Valet and put solar panels up there and sell to the grid? Yeah. So I mean, our union thinks about that, not just me, everybody. You know. um, another question. And that's why we created the Blue-Green Alliance. That's what you're referring to. We created the Blue-Green okay. Alliance. And right now I got a meeting of the Blue-Green Alliance in a few minutes on the telephone. The Blue-Green Alliance has 15 million affiliated members. Wow. And when we started, there was me, Dave Foster, and Carl Pope, and we had a press conference in the press club in Washington, and five journalists, two of them I think were drunk, showed up. That was it. So <laughs> this is 10 years later. Ten millions. years later, we got almost 15 million wow. affiliated members through the Sierra Club, uh, Environmental Defense Fund, the United Steelworkers, a bunch of other unions. I mean, the, the, we've got six of the major environmental firms and about 17 unions mm -hmm. affiliated to the Blue Green Alliance. And we we meet and we develop strategy. We debate issues internally, and you don't very often see us fighting in the street because we've done most of the things behind closed doors, trying to come to consensus, which is good. Right. Um, I, I'll finish with a couple more questions. Uh, one I, I like to, to often ask, and I'd like to see, uh, see your take on this, but do you believe there's a disconnect between the general public and uh, the natural resource world? Um, and it'd be interesting to, to get uh, a labor well, well, perspective. It depends what you mean by the natural resource world. You mean mining? Mining, metallurgy. Uh, yeah. You can even go with petroleum, too. I mean, it's pretty big in Canada as well. Yeah, look, at, I, I actually think that there's a, uh, there's a huge disconnect um, and and um, look at it, it, it's, I maybe call it the Sudbury story that I was telling you about. When, when Inco would deny that the hot water emissions that were coming out of the smelter were causing the fog that caused accidents during the spring and fall more than, more than the winter, when Inco would deny that the place looked like the moon because of their actions. Uh, people got to see that's what INCO is, that's what mining is. Well, that's not what it is today, okay? And the same thing happens in the paper sector. When we would drive to Espanola where my uncle worked, the smell of rotten eggs as they would call it, I would start to moan and complain and my dad would say, shut up, that's the smell of good jobs. Now you go to Espinola, you don't smell any of that, but they're still making paper. And, but people my age would still remember Espinola the way it was then. And so the, the paper industry, the mining industry, steel industry, lots of the energy intensive industries, 
did not do a good job and in many ways are not doing a good enough job of connecting what used to be there 30 years ago is not the way it is now. And, uh, you know, take, for example, forestry. Uh, Canada and, and the U.S. both, but Canada primarily, have the most sustainable forestry practices in the world. People don't see it that way. They still see them as these bastards clear-cut everything and, you know, they're leaving waste behind. Or the paper industry putting mercury into the water. They don't use mercury anymore. So the, these industries have not done a good job of connecting the current reality to what they do. And because of that, there's a negative reality on these industries. And if you look at them from an economic perspective, and particularly in Canada, Canada is one of the most resource-rich countries in the world. One of the things that troubles me a lot is that we export our raw resources without adding value to them. So whether you want the petroleum industry or the forest industry, we export raw logs, but we don't add value to them, making them into timber or two-by-fours. We export raw crude. Well, why don't we finish the raw crude by higher environmental standards than it's going to be done in China, bring value to them, and if we use them for our own basis, fine, but we can also export some with value added and create jobs. Fishing industry, the same thing. Mining industry, the same thing. So one of the things that Canada's done or not done is add value to its resources and has become, as we used to say when I was younger, you know, hewers of wood and drawers of water. We know there's going to be a fight with the U.S. between Canada and the U.S. within the next 50 years over water. If, if California doesn't start getting its water back, where are they going to want it? They've got to get it. They're going to want to make a deal. The Liberal government in British Columbia sent, uh, sold uh, uh, 2 million liters of water to Nestle's for 25 cents a liter. We're going to sell water, bottled water from Canada to Nestle's, and they're going to export it? You know? We make better use of our water than that. Yeah. So, and, uh, you know, the, the other thing is that uh, our union in Canada is attached to the mining industry and the steel industry. And uh, you'll, you'll probably have seen in the paper in the last couple of days, uh, some bosses got convicted and are going to be, they're, they're sentenced to jail for killing the four people in Toronto off the scaffold. Yes, I, yeah, I saw that in the yeah. Our union has been running a campaign now since Westray, the Westray disaster that killed 26 people. Those workers called my office while I was national director, and I knew some of them from the Elliott Lake days, who said, Leo, the emissions here and the, and the coal dust here is worse we've ever seen. We need a union or else we won't get this cleaned up. I sent an organizer there. Two days after he got there, the mine blew up. 26 workers were killed. No one paid a price, even though there was a Royal Commission who said it was the management's decisions. So we started a campaign called Stop the Killing, the Westray Bill. It took us 10 years. We got the Westray Bill passed federally. It became the law of the land. No one had ever been convicted. We started a program three years ago. We met and have run from coast to coast, saying if you're willfully neglect and someone gets killed, you can be held criminally responsible. Uh, we're not interested in putting people in jail, per se. We're interested in clean workplaces. And if you have the possibility of facing jail time, you'll probably make sure your workplace is safer and that you take the right measures. So it's a sad uh, reason to be pleased. But the fact that these guys got convicted is the first conviction under the Westray Bill in 15 years now. And our interest is safe workplace and not putting people in jail. But this now sends a signal to everybody. Yeah. And we're not going to stop. We're, we're having meetings with police associations, with coroners, uh, the RCMP, with uh, Crown attorneys, with uh, ministers of labor. We're having meetings in, in communities where we're having community meetings in places uh, because our objective is to get safe workplaces. Workers shouldn't go to work to die or to get sick. Absolutely. Well, uh, well, I think we'll stop it right here. Okay. That's all the time we have, but thank, thank you very much. Okay, is that enough for you? Yeah. Did, did you want to?